George Galloway, and the mother of all talk shows. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway. France has a new Dauphin, 34-year-old new prime minister who will sit on a footstool next to the little emperor Macron, about whom more later. And glorious scenes in Ramallah in the West Bank of Palestine where lit up in gold is the statue of Nelson Mandela in Nelson Mandela Square as thousands of Palestinians sing the South African national anthem in honor of blessed South Africa's legal case at The Hague beginning tomorrow morning, putting Israel on trial for genocide. And a leading member of the Knesset says, Gaza should burn and all the people in it. And one of the most senior journalists in the country says, that's the settled will of the overwhelming majority of the Israeli public. And they wonder why they're on trial for genocide. And in the Ukraine, things go from bad to worse. They're all getting out to new villas, new chateaux bought by the ill-gotten gains of your taxes. The Russian army advance cannot now be stopped. And it's only a question of how far the Russians want to go. We'll be talking about Joe Biden, about Donald Trump, about Keir Starmer, and about Jeremy Corbyn. It's all coming up here on the mother of all talk shows. Stay curious about our curriculum. Have something to say? Then call us now to join the debate on the mother of all talk shows. The only education you can get for free. George Galloway. The mother of all talk shows. With George Galloway, the world is our classroom, and you're welcome to sit in and join the seminar. France has a new prime minister, 34-year-old. Only two things of interest about him. One is that he is married to a man. Ooh la la, well, it is France after all. And the more important thing is that he has never had a job. I'm not making that up. He has not ever had a job before, but he's the new prime minister of France. Mind you, nobody knew the name of the last prime minister of France who resigned for reasons not yet clear, at least not here. Given the privacy laws in France, it may be some time before the whole show is revealed. But the new prime minister will make no difference because no prime minister under Macron is going to strike out in any kind of independent way. It's a rubber stamp assembly, a rubber stamp parliament in France, as indeed it is in London. Just this evening, the Conservative government passed a law to make it a prosecutable offence to boycott Israel, to boycott anybody as a matter of fact. And that would, of course, have seen half the parliament in prison for calling for boycotts against apartheid South Africa in times gone by, times in which I sat in the parliament when the Labour leadership relentlessly, eventually relentlessly called for the absolute ostracism of apartheid South Africa, for boycott, divestment, and sanctions of South Africa. Today's Labour leaders went to the dispatch box in the opening of the debate to say that they wholeheartedly opposed boycott, divestment, and sanctions directed at the apartheid state of Israel. Well, that came as little surprise. Labour had two stories today. First of all, the former leader of the Labour Party and my 
parliamentary colleague for almost three decades, my colleague for almost four decades, was picked by the government of South Africa to join their delegation at The Hague tomorrow, about which more later. This is recognition of Jeremy Corbyn's decades of opposition to apartheid as an idea, to racism as a concept. In the same frame, four Labour members of Parliament went to Israel to show their support for the genocide that appears in court in The Hague tomorrow. Labour has killed itself. It has committed Hari Kiri, millions of people, not just millions of Muslim people, millions of other people, young people, politically conscious people, activist people, will never dream of casting a vote for Sir Keir Starmer, who turns out to be the man who, as director of public prosecutions, prosecuted the entirely innocent sub-postmasters who were ruined, many going to prison because of a computer malfunction in the upper reaches of the post office, now subject to a record-breaking television drama which has got the whole country asking how could this have happened? Well, one of the main reasons why it happened is that the Labour leader, the unequivocal supporter of Benjamin Netanyahu's Zionist government, ordered their prosecution and many subsequently went to prison. If, if there are any more reasons for not voting for Keir Starmer's Labour Party, I really don't need to hear them. Millions of people now know that this double-dealing, spineless hypocrite is unworthy of the position that he holds as the misnamed leader of the opposition in Britain. Not fit for purpose, either in this job or the job that he is looking for as Prime Minister of Britain. But all eyes will be not on France, not on Britain, but on the Netherlands tomorrow, where in Den Haag, The Hague, the International Court of Justice will consider a case tabled by South Africa. How fitting is that? Tabled by South Africa, but supported by everyone from the Maldives to Turkey, from the Arab League to most African countries, including Kenya, uh, which has been the recipient of a great deal of agitational lobbying by Israel over decades, whose prime minister today said he was fully in support of South Africa's move. It is a badge of honor for South Africa. And for those of us, like Corbyn, like me, who stood with South Africa during the dark days when Nelson Mandela was being called openly in Parliament a terrorist, when the African National Congress were routinely denounced as communists and that their leader deserved to be in the dungeons of apartheid. I, as I've told you before, actually gave some of my blood on the floor of the Guguletu police station in Cape Town, South Africa, during the apartheid era, after taking repeated blows from a racist apartheid white South African police officer who had the name of Campbell and whose antecedents were Scottish. I always knew never to trust a Campbell. We are proud of South Africa this evening. Whatever happens in this case tomorrow, but whatever happens, can only be a travesty of justice if it does not find in favor of the South African case, an 80-page case, which largely consists of threading together the public statements 
of the Israeli leaders themselves from Netanyahu downwards, including the defense minister, including the finance minister, including the economy minister, including all the high officers of the Israeli state. Their own statements condemn them of the crime of genocide, the ultimate crime introduced after the Second World War as a response to the genocide of the Holocaust visited upon tens of millions of people in Europe, six millions of them Jewish. It is the ultimate irony that in 2024, a state claiming falsely to be the state of the Jews should be facing a genocide case in the ICJ at The Hague because that state is now the nearest thing to what happened in Nazi-occupied Europe in the late 1930s and 1940s. It's almost impossible to exaggerate the irony of that. And yet, if you read South Africa's document, South Africa's case, it contains all the evidence that you could possibly imagine. Words that Goebbels himself could have spoken. Words that Eichmann himself could have evinced. Words that could have been said by the people in charge of the ovens, the death camps of Auschwitz, Treblinka, and all the other terrible hell holes where millions of people were eviscerated, annihilated, not for anything that they had done, but merely because of who and what they were. What's the difference between what's happening in Gaza and what happened at the uprising of the Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto? Nothing. There is no difference at all. In the Warsaw Ghetto, the Nazis put them behind wire and then massacred them. In Gaza, the Israelis put them behind wire and then massacred them over and over and over and over again. So many times, even a scholar of the issue like me would find it difficult to enumerate, to adumbrate all the genocidal assaults there have been on the people of Gaza. And not even just since 2008, when they voted for Hamas. Long before it, I myself in the Jabalia camp witnessed Israeli border guards, Druze, I should tell you, not Jews, Druze, Israeli border guards, were forcing women with toothbrushes to clean the road in the street in which they lived. I witnessed it in a jeep belonging to the United Nation. The crimes committed by a state which claims to be the state of the people who suffered the last great genocide of millions is now in the dock. And I have no idea how they can possibly begin to mount a defense. And I say what I said on Sunday. If this is a court at all, if these judges are judges at all, if this justice is justice at all, then the case must be upheld and a cease and desist order must be issued and if it is it will have the most profound impact on the Palestinian case the Palestinian cause that there has ever been because it will make it in many cases legally impossible for western governments especially so-called democratic governments to have anything to do with that genocide state in the future. 
the law says that genocide must be stopped and must be punished. Well, you're not going to be allowed to sell weapons, give succor and comfort, give diplomatic cover to a state found guilty of genocide because you yourself can then be prosecuted, something which you saw a taste of before a House of Commons Select Committee this very week when David Cameron, who, when Prime Minister of Britain, described Gaza as the largest open-air prison in the world, and moreover said it must not be allowed to continue to be. Now that his Foreign Secretary was asked by the Select Committee if any official in the Foreign Office had pointed out to him that Israel was breaking international law in turning off water, turning off power, blocking food, making the people of Gaza starve whilst being bombed relentlessly 24-7 for 96 days. Do you know what his answer was? I can't remember every piece of paper that has crossed my desk. Well, you would have remembered that one, Mr. Cameron, because that one makes it illegal for you to do what you are doing, which is to facilitate the attacks on Gaza through the British base in Cyprus. It would make it illegal for you to be acting on behalf of a state which your own officials have warned you is in breach of international law. So it's unlikely that you are so incompetent, Mr. Cameron, that you did not know if you had been so advised, or I'm not sure if this is worse or not, or you were being dishonest in front of that select committee of parliament this week. Either way, if the judgment in The Hague goes against Israel, it will be legally impossible for any Western government on pain of being prosecuted themselves for breaking the court's decision on genocide. It will change everything. It will knock BDS into a cocked hat. It will change all things utterly. And if the court finds Israel guilty of genocide and orders it to cease and desist in a presidential election year in the United States, it will surely be impossible, even for the bloodthirsty gang of cutthroats, Biden and Blinken and co, to do other than tell Israel to cease and desist desist. At which point Netanyahu falls, maybe goes to prison. At which point everything in the world, the whole chessboard is turned upside down. So there's a lot riding on this case. Tomorrow in the UK you'll be able to watch it live from 9 a.m. The press release from the court says 10 a.m. Bear in mind that 10 a.m. in The Hague is 9 a.m. in London. For the rest of you, you can do the maths. I expect that no court in all history will have been so closely watched. Now, it's possible, of course, that these judges will turn out to be the same kind of stooges that are getting ready to send Julian Assange into 175 years of penal servitude. That's possible. But here's my take. It's this. I said it on Sunday. Most of you disagreed with me. Many of these countries, including Joe Biden, must, as a matter of simple political logic, be looking for an exit ramp from what is turning out to be a nightmare of catastrophic proportions for everyone concerned, for the Arab rulers, 
for the state of Israel itself, for the Palestinian people above all, for the people of Lebanon who may soon be plunged into an all-out war between the partisans of the Lebanese resistance and the Zionist state, for the people of the Red Sea area, for the people of Yemen, for the people of Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, for everybody. This is turning into a catastrophe and there seems no way to stop it because the pit bull in charge, Netanyahu, his savage teeth stained by the blood of tens of thousands of people, has not only no incentive to stop it, he has every incentive to keep it going and to, if possible, expand it into a regional, maybe even a world conflagration. Because he's finished at the end of this conflict. He may be behind bars at the end of this conflict. So you have a classic case where the tail is wagging the dog, where the client state is out of control and may cost Joe Biden, if this continues, any possibility of remaining president of the United States, the subject we are polling you about this very evening. Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night. This is the mother of all talk shows. You don't get to call me far right. You don't get to call me that on my own show. A lifelong socialist, the leader of a socialist party, the Workers' Party of Britain, with an Indonesian wife, with five mixed race children, with a record of fighting racism all of my life, representing more people of color in the British Parliament than anyone in history by a country mile. You don't get to call me far right. These kind of idiotic insults tossed around by infantile leftists who think that anyone to the right of them is a fascist, is a racist. They are the cause of the crashing and burning of what used to be called the left. They are the cause of it. They have discredited leftism with their foolish, idiot isms and ists and smears that emanate from them like a bad smell. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. So as I said, here's the poll this evening. Will Netanyahu cost Biden the 2024 election? Yes or no? You can vote on my telegram, t.me forward slash George Galloway. Please follow me on telegram. You can vote on my Twitter you can vote on the YouTube community poll and you can vote on the YouTube stream. If you're watching on the YouTube stream or on Facebook or any other platform that allows you to do so, please share with all of your followers, all of your friends, all of your associates and make sure you have subscribed to my YouTube channel and like the show and also press the bell so you're alerted whenever I'm broadcasting because it might not be that long before I have to return to the airwaves. Uh, here are the numbers if you want to comment. If you're in the US or Canada, it's toll free, plus one, eight four four nine four four double three double four. That's plus one, eight four four nine four four double three double four. If you're in the UK or Ireland, equally, free of charge. It's 0808 That's 0808 If you're in the rest of the world, as indeed I am myself, it's 0044
five. Now, first up, everybody's favourite American correspondent on the mother of all talk shows, the one and only Garland Nixon. Garland, uh, here's my uh, first question. It's the question we're posing in the poll. Will Netanyahu cost Biden the 2024 election? Uh, my immediate answer would be no, only because, and here's the caveat, because Joe Biden didn't have a prayer of winning the 2024 election before any of this happened. So no, Joe Biden's not going to win the election. Uh, it's one of many things that has convinced the American people that Joe Biden is not the man for the job in 2024. But let's face it, they're hiding this guy. He's lost and wandering around all the time. He's a very tragic figure. Um, so notwithstanding the uh, tragic events in Gaza, Joe Biden had, was, was already a, uh, you know, he was a, a, a ghost of a politician um, to say, to, to give him, you know, the benefit of the doubt. I just watched him in the Oval Office with President Jokowi of Indonesia, one of the world's most important, biggest countries. And uh, Jokowi gave him a little soliloquy about the need for a ceasefire in Gaza, during which Biden looked comatose. But when he answered Jokowi, he immediately changed the subject without any reference to anything the president had said to the issue of climate change. I don't know if he had someone in his ear advising him to do that, but it's becoming so embarrassing. I mean, it's long ago been embarrassing, but it's now deeply debilitating to have a president that can't even answer the points being made by presidential guests sitting in his own front room. You know, it's a sad state of affairs when we would feel better if Joe Biden was obfuscating and ducking the question, if we thought that he had the cognitive ability to play those kinds of mental games. The sad truth is the likelihood is he didn't remember the question. And the first thing that came to his mind, I'm sure they gave him a number of talking points. One of them was climate change. So whatever question was asked, he had to reach for the, the closest talking point that he could grasp. And that was it. Right now, Joe Biden is nothing but a con at best. He's a conduit for power at best. He's something he's like an empty tube that the the oligarchs can yell through at best. At worst, he's an embarrassment even to the to the people, to the puppeteers for puppets like Joe Biden. Now, uh, it's a big day in Europe tomorrow, uh, Garland. Uh, the whole world will be watching. The ghost of Nelson Mandela will be there in the courtroom as free South Africa uh, lives up to the hopes and dreams of hundreds of millions of people around the world and challenges in court the genocide that's going on in Gaza. Will anyone in the U.S. be watching? Uh, absolutely. You know, that brings us to another point, and that is that Joe Biden and the leaders of the Democratic Party are now completely disassociated from their, I would, I wish what were their constituents, let's just say their voting base, their constituents are actually the people that are funding them, the oligarchs, billionaires, and, and rich Zionists. Mm -hmm. But the, I will say this, the majority of the people in the Democratic Party, probably a plurality of the people in the Republican Party will be watching this, most Americans the polls tell us, want a permanent ceasefire. And I would argue the majority of, the, of Americans are looking at what's happening and seeing clearly that this is an illegal action, that what we have is a very powerful army that is attacking a civilian enclave or prison, however you want to put it. And uh, sadly for them, they're losing that war. But um, uh, uh, a South, uh, uh, South Africa, due to their history, they have the, the moral high ground here. And I, th I can't think of a better country under these circumstances than to be taking this action. And they will have tremendous support from the people of the, um, the, people of, of the United States, though not from the elite ruling class. Amen. I was, as you know, uh, heavily involved in the struggle against apartheid South Africa. And of course, uh, it became an absolute cause celebre uh, in the United States, particularly amongst black people, for obvious reasons. Uh, how much of that 
is responsible for uh, people's feelings in the African-American community about what's happening in Gaza. Mandela said so many times that the apartheid in uh, Israel-Palestine is worse than the apartheid that incarcerated him for 27 years. Mandela said that uh, we will never be truly free until the Palestinian people are free. Has that got through to the black community in the United States? Absolutely. You know, as you know, George, I have a, um, a radio show on, uh, it's a WPFW, it's a Pacific uh, affiliation affiliate here in uh, Washington, D.C., a mostly black and left-leaning audience. And I've literally had, you know, I'm an independent, and of course, I criticize both parties. And occasionally I get a call from someone who says, you know, I'm for the Democrats, why are you criticizing them? I have had callers in the black community call me in recent weeks and months to apologize and say, Garland, I was wrong. You were right. The Democrats are every bit as bad as the, as you said they were. So what I think you're looking at in um, in in the black community in America is people who are not necessarily going to vote for the Republicans, but they're, they're going to stay home. They're not voting for the Democrats. And you know, if as the polls say, Donald Trump is able to get somewhere between eight and twenty percent of the uh, of the black vote in the Democrats. And of course, they're going to get, let's say, another 10% stay home. It's over for the Democrats. They're part, you'll have to go to a museum to find a, a, a Democratic politician if they lose the level of black voting that appears to be walking away from them. Of course, you've got to add the, um, the false promises and the neoliberal policies that have so hurt the black community, which is working class, um, working poor, and poor. The... One of the great ironies of my lifetime, actually, is to see a carefully calibrated chorus of Democrats saying that this next election is about democracy. You have to save democracy. That democracy itself will be murdered if Joe Biden doesn't get uh, your vote. At the same time as doing literally everything, unimaginable things, like seeking to imprison uh, their number one rival. At what point does this cognitive dissonance set in, uh, in uh, am amongst the democratic voting base? How can it be democratic when you've done and are doing everything to strangle democracy in order to get reelected? Well, and you have to add something else that a lot of people outside of the country, the uh, U.S. may not know about, and that is that uh, there are several other people in the Democratic Party, Marianne Williamson, Dean Phillips, a few others, who are running against Joe Biden in the primaries. Four states, North Carolina, Florida, Massachusetts, and Tennessee, have decided that in the primaries, the only name they're going to put on the ballot is Joe Biden. So we have four states in the Democratic primaries who've already said, the good news is we're going to have a primary election. The bad news is, as you know, you literally see this on comedies about Banana Republic, comedy movies, there will be one name on the ballot, Joe Biden. So Joe Biden is going to, apparently, they are going to... Um, save, preserve, and fight for democracy, but they have no intention of actually practicing democracy. It is an extraordinary business. Uh, now, Hunter Biden was uh, uh, briefly uh, in Congress. Uh, someone asked him if he was on crack today. Somebody else asked him, what kind of crack do you smoke? Uh, how, how embarrassing was all of that? Well, there was a hearing today, and um, it was it's called a markup hearing. But basically, um, Hunter Biden was subpoenaed to come before Congress to answer questions about his father's uh, denial of uh, being uh, affiliated with Hunter's business. Um, uh, and uh, he, Hunter Biden refused the subpoena. So now Congress was having a hearing to determine whether or not to have a vote. One, basically one um, group of, uh, one committee was having a hearing and they're going to determine where and when to have a vote before the full, full um, House of Representatives on holding um, uh, 
Hunter in contempt, and which of course is a criminal charge. Hunter Biden and his lawyers showed up today for some period of time. And of course, as you said, on the way out, it was a circus, it was a media circus. And the bottom line is this, most Americans already understand what's going on here. They understand the criminality and the corruption and the implications of it. And uh, the bottom line as it comes down to now is that the diehard Joe Biden supporters now just look at it and say, sure, but we'll take a crooked criminal Joe Biden and his uh, drug addled son um, over Trump. It's not, there's not even a discussion as to whether Joe Biden is guilty anymore because that ship sailed a long time ago. It's just a matter of whether you'll accept that Joe Biden is a criminal or whether you're, 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 you have such a bad case of Trump derangement syndrome that you're going to overlook his criminality or, and in fact, uh, accept it. What of the, the Zion Don, uh, as, uh, He's known. You couldn't slip sixpence between them uh, on the Israel-Palestine question, of course, as you can't between uh, the Democrats and the Republicans. But on the big enchilada, which is still there, still big, what's going to happen in Ukraine? Is, is Trump still holding to the position, no more money, no more weapons? an end to the war in the Ukraine? Um, absolutely, he is. And the, the, the fact of the, uh, of the matter is, you know, and of course I said this long ago, um, Trump was smart enough to know very, very early that in the long run, this was not going to be popular. And he's held on to the position. Um, and the, his position is growing. It's growing in his party and it's growing throughout the U.S. People are asking some obvious questions, namely, you know, are we really supposed to believe that the Zelensky regime wants to bring, what, five to 10 million Eastern Ukrainians and Crimeans back into Ukraine, where it is literally illegal to speak their native and ethnic language? It is literally illegal for them to practice the religion that they practice. We're supposed to believe that Zelensky wants to repatriate those people. And then, this is the wonderful part, and then Zelensky immediately after the war, because we know this is a democracy, right? He's going to have an election and allow 10 million Russian speaking people to suddenly vote and they're going to vote in a pro-Russian uh, president. The idea, the, the, that, that narrative, when you run it down to what they're actually telling us, is so preposterous that people are starting to wake up and say, A, this doesn't make sense, B, why, why is it costing my all of my money, and C, you know, when is this going to be over because I feel threatened by nuclear war? This thing is going bad, and the Biden administration seems like they're trying to drift away from it too. Now, this last question might be lighthearted, or it might be the most important question I've ever asked and you've ever answered. There seems to be aliens running around in, I think it was in Phoenix, uh, where else, arising from the, the ashes. Uh, there's, a, there's a jellyfish UFO popping up everywhere. Should we be worried? Are they trying to tell us something? Well, you know, we the, a, a week or so ago, it was Miami. There were allegedly aliens running around a mall in Miami. Um, you know, these things, that, I hate to say it, I think they're kind of a fun distraction from, you know, nuclear war. Um, you know, the, basically, the only exciting um, news that we get that isn't horrifying people is either aliens or something to do with Taylor Swift. I think at some point they're going to meld the two and either Taylor Swift, Swift will be an alien or the alien aliens will be taking Taylor Swift away, but that's where we are now in America. I'm glad for that because every time I turn on the news, you know, there's no siren saying that the nuclear missiles are coming. So I'll take aliens right now over some of the far worse things that we could be reporting. <laughs> or even Taylor Swift, Garland yeah, Nixon, Taylor Swift. as always. Th thanks very much for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. What a guy. Will Netanyahu cost Biden the 2024 election? Yes or no, you can vote now on my Telegram, on my Twitter, on the YouTube community poll, or on the YouTube stream. And you can call us uh, if you're in the US or Canada. It's plus one eight four four nine four four double three double four. 
If you're in the UK or Ireland, it's 08081 9655522. If you're in the rest of the world, it's 0044203 I'll be back with some of your calls right after this short break. The airwaves. This savannah is a rigid dichotomy of fact and fiction. As vicious as the Twitter sphere where the slightest misjudgment can spell being cancelled. One species rules over the airwaves through its ability to adapt and survive in even the harshest environments. The George Galloway. The top cat in these parts, it is mostly active on Sunday evenings in Britain and mid-afternoon in the United States. It seldom roars during the day. Most notable for its wide variety of headdress, it protects these parts from the mainstream media. You can catch this fine specimen on the mother of all talk shows. Don't pick a fight with it. They've been known to bite back. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Now, I'll be speaking on Friday evening at 7 p.m. in the London borough of Newham in the east end of London. If you're within striking distance of that, do come along and see me. 7 p.m. in Newham on Friday night at the Afro-Caribbean Centre. A YouTube comment somewhere over the rainbow says, uh, George, again, I don't think the poll question is any useful at all. Each clown American president has a role and a plan. It is a cycle, a well-planned cycle. I wish I could agree that it was well-planned. Colette Day says Israel doesn't have a get-out-of-genocide-free card, or does it? Uh, let's take a call from Sahar in Sheffield in England, but on Palestine. Sahar, welcome to the show. Hello, hi. Thank you for taking me in, for inviting me to this lovely show. I just wanted to say, um, um, uh, actually camping with my friend in front of the town hall in Sheffield. Should I carry on? Wow, this is a protest, yeah? Yeah, it is a protesting. We are protesting against the genocide going on and committed by the Israelis against our people in Gaza. Marvellous. And uh, what's the reaction of the public to the protest? And what's the reaction of the authorities? So it's basically we, we receive a lot of visitors during the day and the night. We are camping 24-7. We have supporters from the Palestinian Solidarity Campaign and co- Coalition in Sheffield who are taking turns into uh, covering the rota for the camp. Every, you know, like every four hours we have four people covering the rota to keep us safe and to, to keep around us. Uh, it's it's been cold. It's been raining, uh, but the overwhelming messages of support and solidarity from all people around us is great. It's really huge. The only thing we are angry about, and we feel like they want to silence us. We didn't have any MPs to show any solidarity. We didn't have, you know, we had a few demands. 
Uh, we agreed on three demands. First thing is to declare Sheffield as Israeli apartheid free zone. Secondly, we uh, wanted to uh, bring and investigate everyone who has joined the IDF, the Israeli uh, defense or the, the, the so-called Israeli defense uh, forces, exactly to bring them to, to be investigated and exactly the same how things happened to Shamima Begum before. Uh, and the third, the third thing is we would like to see a, a, a long-lasting solution uh, end of occupation, a long-lasting uh, solution for the Palestinians based on self-determination and just and uh, apartheid-free uh, and uh, stop the colonization. Well, uh, I'll tell you what, Sahar, I'm so old, I remember when Sheffield was uh, declared itself to be uh, the country's first nuclear weapons-free zone. And they even put a sign up outside the city to tell people. Uh, then the leader of the council was a left-wing firebrand called David Blunkett, a blind man. Nowadays, oh. he cannot see a war. He cannot see an injustice that he's not prepared to support. So it doesn't surprise me that none of your rotten members of parliament have turned up to support you. But what about the councillors inside yes. the town hall? What's we, their we, attitude? Yes. No, we had a lot of support from councillors. The Green councillor came to uh, to give us the solidarity. Uh, we had a few uh, Labour councillors as well to support us in this, and we were overwhelmed with the with with general population. You know, like people around us. It's it's just we are angry with the with the government. We I don't I we don't understand how they see a genocide and they do nothing. We want at least ceasefire now. We request to, to stop killing of innocent Palestinians. Stop it now. Stop killing children. We have, uh, I would send you a few things from the camp. It's, as I said, it's really overwhelming, but still we need support. We need people to talk about. We need everyone to see what's going on in Gaza. I should mention something positive about Sheffield. Sheffield was the first to uh, declare... Uh, uh, in South Africa, you know, uh, since South Africa free, they call it South Africa uh, a free apartheid zone at the time. They were the, the first city to acknowledge and to declare this. And uh, we would love to see this happening in Sheffield here as well, to cease fire, to, uh, to, to urge the government to take a step and to vote for cease fire and now. Excellent. Well, they did it in San Francisco. There's no reason why it can't be done in Sheffield. Sheffield councillors, please note. Thank you, Sahar. God bless your efforts. And if you're in the Sheffield area, go down to the camp. Give them a, a, a bun for their tea. Give them a blanket to keep them warm. Give them your support above all. Angela Sharif says, realistically, what do you think the chances are of Israel being guilty of genocide. The UN have failed for the last 70 years to even pass one resolution. Would Israel accept a guilty outcome? Well, it's not a question of whether Israel would accept a guilty outcome. It's that a guilty outcome would make it legally, if, as well as morally, impossible for other countries to continue their policy towards Israel because the law requires, if a country is found guilty of genocide, that that genocide must be punished. Punished is the word used in the law. And so it's very portentous indeed. And of course, it's all down to the quality of the judges. But the judges know that the whole world is watching. Let's hope they prove to be worthy of their wigs. Uh, Robin is on the line in Norbury in England, but on Palestine. Go ahead, Robin. Uh, hello, George. Actually, it's, it's Adam. Um, first thing I'd like to say is... I beg love, your pardon, I mean, Adam. Like, hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, sir. 
love and respect to the great John Pilger, who passed away recently. Great, great Amen. man he was, as are you. Now, my point which I wanted to um, uh, say is, has, has nobody any eyes? All these are bombs, bombs dropping for, for um, tunnels, and yet I have not seen one picture of one bomb drop and one tunnel revealed. No, that's right. They're on, they're, they're, they, they've proven by the systematic murder of well over a hundred journalists that they are able to pinpoint and kill individuals. Uh, they have proven in Beirut and in Damascus that they can even cross borders and murder people in a house, in an office. Yet we're expected to believe that they have killed 30,000 people, 70% of them women and children, and that it's all been a random accident, collateral damage. The truth is they are deliberately trying to make Gaza so uninhabitable that the natives will leave their native land and clear out to make way for the settlers, for the European North American settlers with their Australian uh, accents, with their Brooklyn accents, with their English and French accents. They want to clear the native people from the land and therefore, by killing as many as possible, by rendering 75% of the housing in the area uninhabitable, by making 97% of the water in Gaza unfit for human consumption, by refusing to turn on the water, the sewage, the electricity, they want to force the Palestinian people to leave. But guess what, Adam? The Palestinians are not going to leave. As you say, if it was really about tunnels, they would have taken out the tunnels and showed us those tunnels. It's not about tunnels. It's not about Hamas. It started long before Hamas. It's happening in the West Bank where there is no Hamas. It's happening in Jerusalem where there is no Hamas. It's happening to the Christian community in Bethlehem, the Armenian Christian community in Jerusalem. It's nothing to do with Hamas. It's nothing to do with Islam. It's about European, North American, Australasian settlers seeking to annihilate or otherwise stampede the local people, the native people, the subhumans, the human animals. Last word to you, Adam. Thank you. Um, two things. One is even the, even the 2,000 pound bomb cannot penetrate to the depths of the tunnels. Fact. Secondly, the reason why people are being led by their nose is in Europe, people still have a guilt of their own anti-Semitism, which is why they don't say, you're a Zionist, you're not a Jew. Jews are like Muslims, Christians, we all deal with love. Zionists have no love in their heart. But because of European guilt, no one will say anything. Well, they'll have to if the judgment goes against them in The Hague. Adam, thanks for that excellent call. Mariv K says, South Africa filed the case against Israel in the ICJ, not in the ICC. What is the difference? Well, you've got to be black or Serbian to be uh, found guilty in the ICC. And I guess the Africans have already worked that out. The ICG is a higher court. It's a court of longer standing. We have to hope that its justices are less uh, likely uh, to be swayed by political uh, pressure. Uh, all these things are uh, important nuances and give me some hope uh, that the result will go the way most of you are hoping it will go. Email from Susie. To lighten the mood, every time I see a picture of Keir Starmer, I think of a hamster. What do you think with best wishes, Susie? <laughs>
Yes, he does. Uh, you're right. Uh, an old friend of mine, a Fra in Belfast, wants to disagree with me. So, of course, the floor is yours, Fra. Hello, George. Thanks for taking the call. George, I'm phoning up. My kind of comments, and hopefully you give me a right of reply at the end, is about the ICJ. I mean, Israel already is outside of international law. America operates outside of international law. The illegal war on Iraq, the drone strikes in places like Somalia and Pakistan and the illegal uh, occupation of Syria are proof of all that. If the ICJ doesn't give uh, natural justice to the Palestinians and confirm that Israel is involved in a genocidal campaign of ethnic cleansing, what you will have is Israel going to the court of world public opinion saying that they are not involved in a genocidal war. And if they do find the uh, Israelis and their supporters uh, guilty of the said crime of genocide, uh, I believe Israel will just ignore it. America, or sorry, America will just ignore it. Oh, no. Neither of them uh, are signatories well, uh, of the ICC might, statute of Rome. The, yeah, they might, of course. Uh, but uh, the crime of genocide is the highest possible crime. Uh, and there's no escape from uh, the requirement on all signatories to the Genocide Convention to halt and punish genocidal violence. And if Israel is found guilty uh, of having involved itself in genocidal violence, then all countries that are signatories to the convention, which includes the United States, which isn't a signatory to the ICC, as you know, but is a signatory uh, to the Convention on Genocide, all countries must bring about the cessation, the desisting of the party found guilty from that genocide and to punish them for it. If they don't, if Rishi Sunak said, well, I don't agree with that judgment, so I'm going to do nothing about it, that would open them up to legal cases in Britain, in France, in the United States, against their own government's failure to abide by the Genocide Convention, which they themselves are signatories to, which is why I have some cause for optimism. Last word to you, Fra. Okay, thank you very much. Well, I'm just going by past experience. We've seen illegal wars. We have seen national uh, assemblies and governments ignoring international law. I don't expect for one second that people in the American administration or in the EU or in any of the countries that support uh, Israel will stop and desist if ordered to by the court. And I just have a different opinion and that I don't believe that the words... Uh, governmental uh, institutions will really get behind us and I don't think you'll see Netanyahu I don't think you'll see Rishi Sunak I don't think you'll see Tony Blair I don't think you'll see Biden or uh, Bush uh, ever before the Hague Okay, thank you very much uh, Dot Tester says Love you Garland, every show, every day Love from Yorkshire, England There you go And Melita Filter says I wish Netanyahu would cost Biden the presidency and vice versa. But I suspect they will both find their ways. Hey, we've got a call from Uruguay. That doesn't happen every day. Pia in Uruguay on Palestine. How's that for a global university of the airwaves? Pia, welcome to the show. Well, yes, thank you. I am, uh, I, I've always been a nomad. And so it doesn't surprise me that I ended up in Uruguay after having lived in uh, many different states in the U.S. and different countries and always favoring, well, I have to say it, Mexican food, uh, although you won't find that much here. Um, but I'm calling as no, a former won't. elected official. Yeah, I, it's all suave. <laughs> um, as a... As a city council member and for one year a vice mayor of Katati, California, which is a very small two-square-mile town in Northern California, I learned 
that when people who have a strong belief in something come forward to their local councils, their townships, their counties, their whatever you want to call them, and they express their extreme passion for a certain idea or action that the council ends up having to listen because those are the constituents. Those are the real constituents. The federal government representatives, they don't have real constituents. They have money lenders. They have people who force them into voting their way when they give them a lot of money. At the local level, as you expressed earlier and I tweeted earlier, San Francisco is the largest city to pass a resolution calling for a ceasefire. There's also a small group. Well, no, I can't say a small group. There's a group of people in Twitter who are daily uh, posting mm, discussions about Gaza, Lebanon, what's happening, news updates, aid for Gaza, especially aid for northern Gaza where things are very difficult, uh, and trying to enlist the help of Jordan and France and any other regional entity that will help get more aid into Gaza and all of Gaza, all of Palestine, for everyone who suffers. So I want to request that everyone who is listening to this go to your local council meetings, your township meetings, your county supervisor meetings, and demand that they support a ceasefire and immediate aid to stop further famine, further disease, further genocide. We need everyone to go into their council offices, into the meetings, and peacefully request that their representatives at the local levels do this because it works. I know it because I was a locally elected official. Well, uh, yeah, and I, I heard did, it. Uh, and it worked in uh, San Francisco. Thanks for the call, Pia, in Uruguay. Uh, I'm a free man of the city of San Francisco, awarded to me for my work on Palestine, on the steps of City Hall itself. So. It was a particular delight for me that the San Francisco Council voted by eight votes to three to demand a ceasefire. And that decision didn't come out of nowhere. It came out of campaigning to force the local authority representatives to vote. Uh, here's some information on action. Uh, it's just disappeared. I'll get it up uh, later. Uh, yeah, there's a march on Washington for Gaza on Saturday, January the 13th at 1 p.m. And the location is Freedom Plaza, 1325 Pennsylvania Avenue, NW, Washington, D.C. So that's Freedom Plaza, 1 p.m. on Saturday. Please, if you can reach D.C., do so and be on that demonstration. I'm um, well past my break time. I'll take it very briefly. After that, we've got our favorite professor from Europe, Dr. George Samuli. Stay tuned. As the green smoke rose, their faces flashed out pallid green and faded again as it vanished. Then slowly the hissing passed into a humming, into a long, loud, droning noise. Suddenly a humped shape rose out of the pit and the ghost of a beam of light seemed to flicker out after it. Forthwith flashes of actual flame a bright glare, leaping from one to another, sprang from the scattered group of men. It was as if some invisible jet impinged upon them and flashed into white flame. It was as if each man were suddenly and momentarily turned to fire.
Will Netanyahu cost Biden the 2024 presidential election? Yes or no? You've got about oh, 35 or 40 minutes maybe to get your vote in. 20,343 people have voted so far and overwhelmingly they believe that Netanyahu will cost Biden the presidential election. George Samuli is the senior research fellow at the Global Policy Institute and author of Bombs for Peace, NATO's humanitarian war on Yugoslavia. Like me, he has a very close interest in what's going on in Serbia right now, where a color revolution, albeit a very pallid one, is uh, underway. Let's start with that one, if we may, uh, George. It's a pretty half-hearted, half-cocked attempt uh, to undo the result uh, of the Serbian elections. Uh, should we stop worrying about it or is the playbook still open? Well, I, I, it is indeed uh, half-hearted, George. Um, the problem with the, uh, the, the anti-Vucic forces who came out en masse is that they got a half-hearted support from the West Whereas the, the Germans, you know, with this crazy woman who runs their foreign policy, Annalena Baerbock, clearly came out in support of them and said, yeah, this is outrageous, unacceptable what Vucic has done. The Americans uh, were much more ambivalent and seemed to side with uh, Vucic against the protesters. So why are the Americans doing this? Well. They see Vucic as really their, their best means of getting Serbia on board for U.S. foreign policy. They think that Vucic, with his credentials, he had worked for Milosevic, he's supposedly a Serbian nationalist, he had been a member of the uh, uh, Sheshels party. He is the best means of getting Serbia to accept Kosovo, uh, the independence of Kosovo, and getting Serbia on board for NATO's anti-Russian policy. They think that, the Americans think that if you try to get him out and get one of these um, you know, fake, artificially created liberals in charge, they'll never be able to persuade the Serbs to accept uh, Kosovo. They'll never be able to, uh, the loss of Kosovo, they'll never be able to accept, uh, uh, force the Serbs to give up on Russia. So this is their, their, their bet. And that's why the Americans have been pushing Vucic and have not really been that enthusiastic by any of the um, anti-Vucic uh, protests. But they haven't been successful uh, so far. Uh, Vucic has completely resisted uh, their anti-Russian imprecations, sanctions against Russia and so on. Uh, and that's because a very substantial proportion of the Serbian people are very sympathetic to Russia. I know this myself, spend a lot of time there. Uh, but almost everybody in Serbia would revolt against selling out Kosovo. So it may be a forlorn hope on Joe Biden's part. It is a forlorn hope. I, I absolutely agree with you. I think that, you know, unfortunately, the, the Serbian political leadership is is, I think, very insipid, very weak and useless, and would probably go along with um, NATO's uh, entreaties, you know, just do this, do this, and we'll reward you, we'll get you, fast track you into uh, the EU, um, Just, but just follow us on our foreign policy. And, you know, the politicians would be happy to go along with it. The public, however, is absolutely adamantly uh, opposed and that's why the, none of these plans really works out. I mean, Vucic makes, you know, these occasional odd comments like, well, you know, we have to think about our future, you know, our future is it with the EU, maybe, you know, maybe we, we're gonna, we can help Ukraine. Maybe I, I don't really mind if maybe some Serbian uh, weapons end up in Ukraine. And then right away there is outrage among the Serbian public and uh, and nothing much happens. So. Uh, you know, it's, it's it's a problem that yes, you you have a political elite that really they they, they look to the EU uh, uh, and, and NATO as the future, but um, the overwhelmingly the public is uh, very pro-Russian uh, because Russia has been consistently uh, supporting Serbia, and they will not sign off 
on the loss of Kosovo. It just cannot happen. You know, even after all these years, they will not accept that. God bless them. Uh, what about France, George? Uh, what can you tell us, if there's anything to tell, uh, about this new uh, boy uh, who is Prime Minister of France? Uh, is that because it's not important to be the Prime Minister of France? Or could they not find anyone who'd actually ever done a job before? In this case, I, it's hard to figure out what... Um, this uh, guy's um, credentials are. He's never held any senior ministerial position. You know, he was briefly um, minister for education. He was also a spokesperson for the uh, government. Um, it's hard to see what he has going from other than that he's a kind of Macron's uh, mini me. He's, you know, he's like Macron. I mean, he's a kind of, he's a younger version of Macron. He's got a fairly vacuous character. Um, Nothing much uh, to be said uh, for him. Um, good looking in a way. And of course, he's gay, which makes him somehow um, a bit trendy and somehow fashionable. Um, but, <laughs> they, but but other than that, it's, it's hard to know what Macron thinks he, he's doing other than he thinks, well, he's my uh, successor, you know, because he's just like me. Uh, France has a real problem uh, on its hands, which is that everything that um, Macron has been doing ever since he came to power in, in 2017 has been uh, geared towards preventing uh, Marine Le Pen from coming to power. Um, but she's doing rather well in the polls, certainly ahead of him um, in the polls, certainly for the European parliamentary elections. And it could, you know, he he doesn't want his legacy to be that after he departs, um, Marine Le Pen takes over. So he's scrambling around, but it's hard to see how this guy it will be the person to um, uh, to stop Marine Le Pen. Well, uh, I predict that uh, Le Pen will win the European parliamentary elections in France. Uh, I'm in France right now. Uh, and yeah. that's uh, certainly how it feels to me. Do you, you yeah, think, so think so too? Absolutely. Absolutely. Ab absolutely. Because they've been, you know, the, the French elites have been trying to whip up this fear about Le Pen now for at least 20 years, you know, but the the trick has got old you know you can't just keep doing it and it's like you know oh, you know le pen le pen is you know becoming then you know france goes fascist uh you know it, the, the, you know all, all all of the french elites have been doing this you know starting from uh, mitterrand and of course marine le pen's uh, father but now it's it's kind of boring and it's lost um its uh, its credibility and i think the french no longer are afraid of Le Pen, and I think that uh, I, I think she'll win. And, and it's clear that the, if you just look at how how she's doing in the polls, she's never done as well as this. And and so therefore it, it shows that the whole thing of you know we, France can't go fascist is just you know that's it. It's just an old you know <laughs> it's an old trick. It's gone. It's a little like with with Trump. You know you can, how, how long can you go on saying Trump's a fascist? Trump's Hitler. Trump's Nazi. Trump will take away our freedoms. It isn't working, and 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 you know you you got you got to come up with something a little bit better. Now all eyes will be on uh, the Hague uh, tomorrow. Uh, I'm I'm saying, not everyone agrees with me, uh, that if the court were to find in favour of South Africa's uh, motion, uh, that uh, most European governments, if not them all would have to, as a matter of law, reverse course in relation to Israel in this uh, campaign in Gaza and, for that matter, in the West Bank. Do you see it that way? I, I'm, I'm not sure that I do. Um, first of all, I think there is a, a considerable hurdle that South Africa will have to meet because, um, you know, the, the judges... I think they t they do tend to vote according to the government that sent them there. So there's going to be obviously the 
the the the countries that are uh, overwhelmingly muslim they'll they'll favor uh, south africa but you know you've got the united states and the uk obviously they're going to vote against um i don't know how france is going to vote but i think there's a good chance that france will also vote um against um and then you've got how russia and china will work. well russia has a very complicated relationship with israel um i i actually think that i have my doubts whether russia will um support south africa and then china you know you know we've had all these tribunals over the years these fake phony uh tribunals uh claiming that uh, china uh, is committing um genocide against the uyghurs so china doesn't really want to go down the path of um you know lending credibility to uh, uh bringing genocide charges against states because china thinks well somebody's going to do that to us uh, down the road, so I, I I don't know whether the the, the votes are there. They're going to have they're going to be the fifteen judges, and I think they're going to add two more judges. So that's that's seventeen judges. They're going to need nine judges for it um, to go forward. Um, I'm not sure whether the the votes are there, um, but but then you know I mean even if it that goes forward. That's just simply a preliminary finding, you know. Then it it doesn't really address the the actual um you know the, the legal uh niceties of the case which is going to take years and years to resolve um but i think if, if they if if the, the the world court at least says there is prima facie a case for genocide i think that's going to have an impact i'm not sure that it's uh it's going to alter um uh, too too many uh, states policies in, at least in europe Finally, George, uh, the situation in Ukraine on the ground, the military situation, uh, goes from bad to worse for uh, Zelensky. He's effectively run out of money and run out of soldiers. Um, they've, they've, they've pressed old men. Uh, they've pressed young boys. They've pressed women. They've even pressed pregnant women uh, into combat. Uh, five millions uh, of their people have fled and sure ain't going back. I spoke to uh, a couple, a Ukrainian couple, just the other night. Uh, the last thing in the world, I mean, they think they're lucky stars that they are in France. They will never go back, certainly not while there's a war on. Uh, so uh, if you run out of weapons, run out of money, run out of soldiers, must only be a matter of time before you run out of town, no? Well, one would hope so. Um, but it, it, it's clear that um, NATO and the United States are doubling down. Um, they're going to come up with some money from the United States with the, in these budget negotiations. I'm, I'm not sure it's going to be $60 billion, but they'll come up with some money. Um, and then there is all this talk about this $300 billion of... Um, Russian uh, central bank reserves, and the Americans are clearly pushing the Europeans into handing that over to Ukraine. I mean, the Europeans are resisting, or whatever that means. We we know the Europeans never really resist the Americans very much. So they're going to going to give them some money, and I think you know the the, the Americans are going to pull uh, you know a surprise at the uh, the NATO summit in uh, in Washington um, in July. I think they're going to try and push for Ukraine um, into NATO. Uh, I think the Biden administration is just absolutely demented. I mean, it, it's run by kind of de demented uh, figurehead, and and there's just simply no no restraint on it. I mean, I think I think they're going to try and do something so insane as uh, as as pressing uh, Ukraine uh, into NATO, saying this is a an emergency situation. NATO will have to just abandon uh, the rules that it's as governed as the new membership. Uh, we need to uh, get Ukraine in. I mean, a lot of people disagree with me, but I, I don't mean... think that's going to be the July surprise at the summit. The Russians will have to finish the war before July then. I think so. I absolutely think I, they, they should do it because if they don't, I think that's going to be that, an unpleasant surprise uh, coming to them. For the, the, the this will be the seventy fifth birthday, and this is going to be NATO's present to itself. Here we've done something for our seventy fifth birthday party. We've brought Ukraine in. <laughs> we, we we've started World War Three. 
uh, happy exactly. birthday. That's our, that's our little George, present for ourselves. As, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's right out of Dr. Strangelove, that one. You can almost hear Peter Sellers' <laughs> voice quivering. George Samuli, uh, Senior Research Fellow at the Global Policy Institute. Always a pleasure, a delight, actually. Thank, thank you very much, George. And hear you. Thanks uh, very much for uh, joining us. Uh, a quick break, then your calls, then I get to see my wife. Dietary's back. Stay tuned. You have to remember back in 2002, 2003, there was a wish by George Bush for regime change. That's what was driving him. Nothing to do with weapons of mass destruction, which of course didn't exist in Iraq. So they had to construct some sort of formula, some sort of cover story, in order to persuade the British public that intervention in Iraq was right. Now David Kelly, uh, as an expert in weapons of mass destruction, knew that uh, this was untrue. He knew that there were probably no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. That was a guy that could have brought down, that was a guy that could have brought down the whole system. I reckon you're chaff. You've been thrown up to divert uh, our probing. The Foreign Affairs Select Committee, that um, parliamentarian briefing, I think that was an indignity to him. We saw it on the news and my very first thought was shock. Um, oh my God, you know, this man is in the eye of the media hurricane. Uh, he should be protected by that at least. You've got to your hands, Prime Minister. Are you going to resign over this? I don't know the details of how Lord Hutton happened to be selected, but what was certainly the case is that he was the right kind of judge to use from the point of view of Downing Street and the intelligence services as well. Of the 21 days of hearing, only one half of one day was spent on discussing the forensic aspects. That is disgusting. We were given the Hutton report the day before. It was published, but actually what happened was he went too far. The events of 2003 were disgraceful ones in this country's history, and it's unfinished business. Those responsible for an illegal war, those responsible for the death of David Kelly, have not been brought to justice. There's no, been no inquest into David Kelly's death. There needs to be one. We need to make sure that those who behaved in a reprehensible way in 2003 are finally brought to book. There you get Killing Kelly for free, you get the killings of Tony Blair for free, you get exclusive material from me if you'll just support me on Patreon. It'll cost you less than the price of a cup of tea per week in an insalubrious cafe at that. Patreon.com forward slash George Galloway. I really need your help. If you can spare the price of a cup of tea, Gov, and you think I'm worth it, please do it at the end of the show. If you're in the US or Canada, it's plus one eight four four nine four four double three double four. If you're in the UK or Ireland, it's 0808 196 double five double two. If you're in the rest of the world, it's 0044203 uh, The poll, uh, almost 21,000 people have voted now not looking any better for Joe Biden. Get your vote in before the end of the show. Another important action announcement. Uh, London, March, on Saturday the 13th at 12 noon at Bank Junction, London, EC3. Now, that is very, very important. And there's one the following week, which I'll be at uh, in Birmingham the big anti-war demo in Birmingham. Uh, on the line is Simon in Florida, who wants to talk about the ICJ and Israeli weapons. Go ahead, Professor. What would you like to say? Greetings to you, Mr. Galloway, and to your worldwide audience once again. Um, my 33rd appearance of you, so I'm going to have to go into the York right from now on. And... Um, I would like to suggest that there's some other, some other aspects 
context of these events which are going to unfold over the next couple of days that your audience members and many others will be able to watch either using the UN Web TV or the ICJ website where the proceedings will be broadcast in both French and English, so it should be quite accessible, at least for your UK audience. But we've got to consider if the um, issue of the genocide is not embraced by the judges and is re rejected on one or other technical grounds, then what it might do, I would suggest, is demonstrate to the global south that truly the rules of the rules-based order don't apply to them. And that in itself, in a large-scale geopolitical point, particularly in line with what the Chinese and the Russians are telling them, is extremely significant. Now, if, on the other hand, the judges do decide that it's personally impossible for them to make this decision because it will cast them in the light of the Supreme Court of America judges who upheld slavery with the Dred Scott decision in the 1850s in the United States of America, then the issue then becomes one of enforcement. And since the court doesn't have the option of sending out global police or the bailiffs to um, seize Mr. Netanyahu's sofa, that then falls upon other signatories of the convention. Now, once again, you have the potential if a large number of NATO members decline to enforce this first step, which is essentially an injunction before making a final decision on the merits, then that is also going to undermine the standing of all of those uh, golden billion countries for not actually enforcing the rules that they themselves wrote. So in both of those scenarios, it's very hard to see how the West really comes out of this as a winner. Now, um, your audience might like to know, anybody who's going to be um, in or around London uh, 10 days from now, that there will be, in fact, several Israeli arms manufacturers exhibiting their products having recently been displayed in the Gaza Strip at the DefenseIQ.com Armoured Vehicle Exhibition in, of all places, Twickenham, headed up by a British Army general starting on the 20th of January. And people can find the details of that at defense with a C, correctly spelled, IQ.com. And um, in the light of the BDS motion that's passed in the House of Parliament today, it makes one start to think just quite what the good Germans would have done if they had all their legal recourses shut off. How splendid uh, an analogy, I must say, entirely apt. Uh, analogy. I, I I feel kind of alone on the show tonight in entertaining the hope uh, that the judges will not want to be cast in the light of the pro-slavery Supreme Court prior to the American Civil War, and that they uh, that they cannot dismiss the case. Uh, they cannot uh, dismiss it out of hand, uh, and that there are places, I think including Washington, I'm certain included, including uh, David Cameron's Foreign Office in London, that would quite like somebody else to get them out of this hole. And a judgment, uh, albeit a preliminary one, a prima facie one, uh, that called on Israel to cease and desist would help a lot of places. France, definitely. Uh, England, London, uh, I'm, I'm certain, at least in the face of David Cameron. Joe Biden, I'm not so sure. But he must be very anxious, Simon, about how close the presidential election now is and how catastrophic 
uh, everything uh, could turn out. I mean, what if the 30,000 becomes 100,000? What if it becomes 300,000? What if there's uh, rivers of blood on TV, on his watch, caused by weapons he gave? Do you feel me? Well, I, I, I do hear exactly what you're saying, and it's very interesting that the Israeli Attorney General has just yesterday issued a warning to government ministers that they could be held responsible, even if it was deemed that genocide hadn't, in fact, occurred, hypothetically, if that were to be decided, that they might be found guilty and would be subject to punishment for incitement to commit genocide, which is both within the convention and also extraordinarily included within Israeli domestic law to such an extent that he's actually indicated that investigations have been opened against two members of the Knesset and one member of the sitting government. So they're clearly trying to, um, you know, at least demonstrate that whilst they claim they're not doing what would be eventually decided upon, that they're even holding those who one could argue were advocating for that conceptual policy to be enacted, that even those people will be held responsible. Because many of your audience will recall that's how the people who instigated the genocide in Rwanda were found guilty, was because they had been making radio broadcasts inciting genocide but one wonders what tony blair will do with his concept of not only punishing genocide but also operating on the responsibility to protect which in theory would not only authorize countries like egypt and turkey to militarily intervene but would actually oblige them compel them to do so Simon in Florida, you are a national treasure, certainly in the UK, I hope one day at least in the United States itself. David Rainey says, hi from Belfast, where can we watch the court hearing tomorrow morning? Justice must be done and the murderous cowards are held to account along with anyone else who has supported them. Well, Simon just told you where you can uh, find that. You can watch it live from The Hague at webtv.un.org. That's webtv.un.org. Appointment to view, I would have thought. Flowers in Springtime says, can't afford to turn my heating on, but I feel warm and snugly listening to Gigi call out Starmer. I'm glad I have that effect on flowers in Springtime. Uh, and more information on uh, action. There's a march on Washington for Gaza. Uh, I think I've already uh, given that one. That's on Saturday in Washington at 1 p.m. at Freedom Plaza. Where else? In Washington, D.C. Let's take a call from a distinguished lady. I had to cut short last week. I did invite her to call back, and she has... Some ideas for a solution, I think. Laura, in Alaska. Laura, President Putin was only a few miles away from you uh, just the uh, other day I saw. That was as close to the United States as he's got recently. Uh, tell me, what would you like to say? Thank you, George, very much for inviting me back. I'd like to first say thank you to Pia from Uruguay for setting a foundation for what I was trying to say last Sunday, and also thank you for your invitation back. I have a two-part um, action that can be done within the 37 states that have anti-BDS law. We cannot assume that the people of those states know that it's unconstitutional. So what I'm asking the citizens of those 37 states to do is look into action to where you sign petition to end the unconstitutional um, holding of anti-BDS laws within your state. 
This unleashes your politicians from having to sign a loyalty pledge. It also ends the 37 of 50 states that are held to these laws because our Congress has taken and conflated anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism. And friends of mine who have been doing actions have actually gotten fired from their jobs because of their social media postings. This would end that in itself there. The second part of the action I would like my American citizen friends in those 37 states to do is once they have gathered these signatures, take them to your state attorney general and file a petition to end that. But more importantly, do a anti-BDS against our own government by stating that, number one, APEC must register as a foreign agent. It's the only um, lobbyist group that isn't. Number two, look up under um, opensecrets.org where it will give you a list of all of your state and federal politicians that take money from APEC and make your decision to not vote or sustain any political member that's supposed to be representing you, not Israel, and then call mm. them up and let them know in mass that you will well, not be supporting I'm sure them that's, as long uh, as they pay yeah, I, I'm, sh I'm sure that's very good advice. I hope our American friends uh, will take it, especially in the 37 states that have these anti-BDS laws that Laura was uh, referring to. Uh, and that they will indeed in their own private life and with their own private money uh, will exercise their individual right not to buy Israeli products and not to buy from those who are offering products and services in your country, but at the same time, in one way or another, assisting with this genocide. I must say it's wonderful to see McDonald's empty almost everywhere. If you're still going to McDonald's, then shame on you. McDonald's is handing out burgers to the Israeli terror force that is massacring women and children in Gaza. If you're cool with that, then I hope you taste the blood on your cheeseburger. Uh, Donald is in Copenhagen, where there was a huge demonstration for Gaza uh, just the other day. Donald, welcome. Unfortunately, we've just lost Donald. I wanted to hear about Copenhagen. Hope we can get back to him. But good news for me, and I hope for you, is instead of Donald in Copenhagen, I've got Gayatri on the line with the social media Round up. What's rattling, Gayatri? Hello there. Uh, Gem on Patreon. <clears throat> pardon me. Gem on Patreon says somehow they'll turn the ballot in his favor. They're great at managing these things. Democracy is a sham, a show for the ill-informed and business for the morally bereft. When the people take back the power, which is rightfully ours, there needs to be a serious purge of the shameless breadheads lurking in the shadows. Be rid of the suffering and self-perpetual lies that follow them from agenda to miserable outcomes. And uh, also on a I mean, call, TJ... The, the people, uh, but Gayatri, the people making the decision are not politicians. Uh, they're not uh, journalists. Uh, they are judges uh, who have to be mindful of the law and who have to be mindful of their own reputations as jurists. Uh, so it's, it's not really the case that the politicians can fix it any more than mm -hmm. it is the case uh, that a politician can fix uh, the result of a murder trial. Only if the judge was openly corrupt and ready to take orders uh, from other people who have no place, no locus uh, in the case. Now that might turn out to be what happens 
uh, but it will be to the eternal shame uh, of the honorable justices who will no longer be honorable, but dishonorable justices. Sorry to interrupt, go on. Yes, um, it will indeed uh, be the mother of all court cases, wouldn't it? Um, I wanted to um, mention TJ's comment on the poll. He said, if nothing else, and because of social media, we have discovered the depth of scoundrel, corruption, and a thirst for blood to achieve their goals of the West, its allies and Israel, all at the expense of civilians, the uncivilized, the uncivilized has shown up. Yeah, I mean, how does Borrell feel now about the garden and the jungle? I wonder if it ever haunts him, if it ever occurs to him that actually the savage beasts of the jungle are us. Our governments are the beasts of the jungle. Far from being a garden, uh, we are uh, we, we are a terrifying dark jungle filled with savage beasts and we're ruled by them yeah uh, on that note uh, here's an email from ajas he says hi george good program i would just like to add that 2024 will be a year to remember because the law of requital has reached a stage where results are coming out quickly mankind is coming together and hopefully hands of the evil ones will be stopped and finally, I mean, from... Uh, uh, I think that uh, that's true. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. So uh, uh, an email from John in Hong Kong. He says, George, have you noticed as soon as Blinken leaves Israel, the bombing and shelling of Gaza just accelerates? Yeah, uh, Blinken was there calling for restraint, he said, uh, telling them to avoid civilian casualties and 300 Palestinians almost all of them in this case, it's already the overwhelming majority, but almost all of the uh, civilians who were killed yesterday, and they're all civilians, they're not killing many fighters. If they were, they'd be showing us them, uh, but they're not. Of the civilians that were killed yesterday, almost all of them were children. So when Blinken's there, the killing goes up, not down. Funny yep, that. Exactly. Some clients state yep. that, isn't it? Unbelievable. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Um, uh, last one here. Okay. Uh, from... Any more? You got a last one? Yeah. Last one from Alexander Edward Johnson Smith, uh, also on the poll. Um, I feel Biden and the Democrats will do all that on their own. And um, yeah. I mean, uh, Palestine plays a big role uh, in the hearts of many of us around the globe. But I think we should also not underestimate that um, lots of Americans know only America. And I don't know to what extent they even know what's happening in Palestine. Um, uh, and just as he said, you know, the people in America can see for themselves what Biden has done. And yeah, the Democrats themselves will have will make them lose the election, basically. Mm -hmm. Well, Abel Malcolm says, Gayatri Galloway, brains, beauty, and charisma. What more can you ask for? Well, I couldn't ask for more. There is nothing that I have ever achieved in my whole life greater than having married you. Thank you very much indeed for giving us that uh, roundup. Donald in Copenhagen is back. Go ahead, Donald. Uh, yeah, hi, George. Oh. Well, it seems like things have escalated a little bit out of hand now. I recall the first time we spoke, uh, you cut me off thinking that I was going to say something that was anti-Semitic. I'm not anti-Semitic, I'm anti-fascist, but I can't see that Israel is doing anything to encourage people to love them at this point in time in the game. A couple of things I want to address, like this uh, Biden being reelected. I don't think so. I don't think so. And it's not because of Netanyahu, because he's absolutely demented now. But the problem is, is there doesn't matter who they prop up in the White House. That's a Punch and Judy show, obviously. And they have absolutely nothing to do with funding the military, which is what they're doing is funding the military. And with, with uh, what's his name, this uh, Blinken over there talking about the return of the of the uh, Gazans to the north of Gaza, and this, I doubt if that's going to happen, but it plays good for the audience of our, aren't we the good guys? 
In the meantime, he's just handing oh, them more and but more. But all the houses have been destroyed. How how can they I return know. to, they can't, no, to north of Gaza? Land. It's been completely destroyed. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. It's absurd. It's totally absurd. That they, and what they're going to do is they're just going to bulldoze that and clean it all off and build some uh, nice uh, beachfront property for for some more uh, uh, of the uh, people who want to flock there. You know, and uh, you know it's an economic thing. But this, by the way, you know, to see how that that a, a president in the United States has nothing to do with it. All these Congress people that make the laws and the rules and the policies. They have uh, uh, what you call investments in these uh, uh, military uh, uh, providers of military equipment, and they get a kickback from mm -hmm. that. You know, one of them, Diane Feinstein on the Defense Committee, she was a million billionaire when she left office. You know, I mean, and this is so corrupt. And all of these politicians now, I, can, I want to address this and then I'll stop. What they're doing is they're talking about, isn't Trump a bad guy? You know, we cannot allow Trump to come back into office, and they're doing all kinds of things. Trump is a businessman, he, or he says he is. He wants to negotiate with these different countries rather than create conflicts with them, and they don't want that. They want to continue and escalate these conflicts because it puts money back in their pockets. It's so corrupt. No politician standing up there is, needs to talk about who the worst candidate is, why don't they address the issues like the corruption and the kickbacks and the and the insider trading, make that illegal, for example, you know, or sit and say people need to be prosecuted for crimes. We sat and watched, for example, this is how the legalities are in the United States. Everybody sat and watched uh, a policeman, a so-called law enforcement agent, murder a guy for 10 or 12 minutes or whatever it was, choke him to death. And he wasn't given, that's first degree murder. He was given manslaughter or some nonsense, you know. I mean, until these, I'm, uh, in regards to law and order, I'm a real uh, staunch uh, right winger on that. A real, and for a lot of ideas, my, I have a brother-in-law from uh, from Cork in Ireland, and he asked me, he came to visit, and he said, well, are you on the left or the right? And I told him, well, it depends on the issue. And it's as simple as that. But I'd like to reiterate, Austin, that you mentioned, I've been boycotting Israel for, I've been living in Denmark near for almost 25 years. I don't buy anything from Israel, personally. And I'm not going to buy anything from the United States either. That's what we need to do is to boycott these countries and let them feel it economically. And that might do some good, you know. But when you like push him into the corner, well, Donald, uh, you're a remarkable. You you you're a remarkable man. That was a remarkable call uh, from Copenhagen in Denmark, an American abroad for 25 years, uh, who calls for the boycott of the United States. I can't boycott everything from the United States. My favorite musicians are there. My my some of my favorite authors are there some of the movies and television series that I watch and love are from there. I can't boycott everything American. But I'm definitely boycotting everything on the BDS list. And so should you. Arif is in Birmingham. Let's hear from him. Go ahead, Arif. Hi, George. Pleasure to speak to you. Hi. And... Uh, Peace and blessings to all, all of you. George, I've followed you for many, many years, sir. I don't think, in my opinion, there's a, a, a person who I've ever come across that stands his ground. And uh, I remember the case you took into the States and you challenged them and you came back with victory uh, with the uh, false allegations that made against you. But that, besides the point, George, George, I'm just looking at another dimension in this uh, Gaza war conflict. And that's, could this be a religious conflict in the guise of it's not Islam versus Christianity versus Judaism but an ideology, a, a Zionist ideology in establishing their their leader that is supposed to come into, in the future and they will then govern and rule from Israel as we know today. Obviously it's common knowledge that they have plans to expand the borders of Israel and uh, some of their actual wording from the river you know the actual when they when people are chanting out from the river to the night uh, 
well, I'm sure you've come across it, but what you I'm trying see, to say is that, yeah, 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 that was originally coined by the Zionists themselves. Um, but yes. the point I'm trying to and make they, is, and, and they might not have, and and they might not have meant the Jordan River because, as I think you're alluding, uh, their flag, the two lines at the top and bottom right. of their flag, uh, designate the rivers Nile and the Euphrates in Iraq. Uh, so That's the right. original Zionists uh, believed that all of that land from the Nile in Egypt to the Euphrates in Iraq. Of course, they would love that, but, but they're not capable of achieving that, Arif. And it's important to, not to, uh, uh, to imbue uh, one's opponent uh, with false uh, prowess. They cannot even control Gaza, and they will never be able to control it. They will never build their beachfront properties. They will never be able to control the West Bank. They can kill, they can destroy, but they will never be free from the resistance uh, of the Palestinian people. So the idea that they're going to go on and conquer uh, Jordan and half of Iraq going to conquer half of Egypt up to the River Nile is for the birds. It's in their dreams, no doubt. It's in their ideology, for sure. The Zionists are no more and no less than a nationalist ideology. They are nothing whatsoever to do with religion. The founders of Zionism were all, to a man, atheists. Anybody who thinks Netanyahu is religious hasn't looked too closely into his private life uh, or that of his family for that matter. There's nothing religious about Netanyahu. These people are extreme nationalists, exceptionalists. Some Americans believe in American exceptionalism. The Zionists believe in Jewish exceptionalism. And all, nobody in truth is exceptional. God didn't give anybody anything, didn't give any country to anybody. God never decided that you were better than someone else. On the contrary, God made all men and women equal, not one superior to the other, not one exceptional and the other unexceptional. God didn't decide that a Palestinian child's blood is worth less uh, than the blood of an Israeli or a Parisian or a Londoner. That's a, a blasphemy against God. So there's nothing religious about it. It's about land. It's about nationalist supremacy, ethno-religious supremacy on the land of Palestine. And the Europeans colonized Palestine in the same way that the Europeans colonized South Africa. That's why tomorrow's case is so piquant, so fitting, so apt. The victims of white European colonialism are coming to the aid of other victims of white European colonialism. And they're doing the whole world a signal service. All hail the Republic of South Africa. Max Watson says, George, is it true Blinken's stepfather was Robert Maxwell's lawyer? It is indeed in glorious technicolor. It is true. David in Swindon disagrees with me on the ICJ. Let's hear from him. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, you're, uh, yeah we've spoken many times. On your opening comments that you said that the uh, criminal court justice will change everything. I disagree. I think it will change nothing. Because okay. if, if, if they give the go-ahead for it, uh, which is the two days, it could take years and years for the actual judgment to come through. But, like one of your earlier guests said, they make the rules. The people who are on the, the thing are the rule-based orders. And as you said, like with your golf club, they make their own rules. They will just ignore the judgment and carry on. So, much as I'd like to think that you well, are you're right, entitled, I uh, yeah, you're, you're, you're entitled to that view, 
but that view requires your belief that these judges, these eminent legal authorities, are corrupt. Is that your view, Dave? No, 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 no. Even if they, they use all of their skill and they find in favor of South Africa, the other, uh, America and Israel, will just ignore it, the same as they ignore, they build settlements. They'll just ignore it. But the, and who's yeah, going to, and like I, your of course other I, I get, I get, no, look, I, I get that cynicism, but the convention is clear. Anyone found guilty by the court is effectively creating an injunction. It's called cease and desist. So although the whole case can go on for years, the cease and desist does not go on for years. That has to happen immediately until the case is decided. The court can decide on Friday or over the weekend to order Israel to cease and desist while the case is then considered. Now, of course, Netanyahu might well say, well, I'm not going to cease and desist. My point is, for European governments that are signatories to the convention, they would then be leaving themselves open to prosecution by citizens in their own countries if they did not respect the cease and desist motion. You see my point? That's the difference, Dave. I see now. Okay. And I, I hope you I hope you are right. Believe me. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed, David. God bless you. Uh, the poll results, 21,855 people have voted. Will Netanyahu cost Biden the 2024 election? On Telegram, 84% say yes. On Twitter, 87% say yes. On the YouTube community poll, 87% say yes. And on the YouTube stream, 88% say yes. Last call. We've been to Denmark. We've been to Uruguay. Why wouldn't we go to Sweden? Lass or Lassie in Sweden on Israeli lies. Go ahead, sir. Yes, thank you. I'm a second time caller. Yes, I would like you to talk a little about the barrage of lies that has uh, come from Israel. And uh, then if you could touch a little bit, uh, educate people about the Dahia doctrine uh, developed by uh, this general, Gadi Eisenkot. Uh, regarding the lies, I, uh, I have noted the 40 beheaded babies, uh, babies in a laundry line that was debunked by an Israeli journalist. Uh, the Hamas mass rapes well, it was debunked by the Jewish journalists. Aaron Maté and Max Blumenthal, uh, and, and more. Can you uh, remember any more? Uh, uh, well, uh, I'll tell you, I'll, yeah, well, thanks uh, for that and giving me the opportunity to sum up uh, thus. First of all, Max Blumenthal and Aaron Maté are, to me, not just American heroes. Uh, they are global heroes with their skill, their forensic journalism, but above all, their courage. As an American Jew and a Canadian Jew, the case of Matty, whose father uh, was a survivor of the Holocaust, the level of heroism required to take the stand that they have, the level of skill and professionalism that is required to debunk the billion dollar empire of the New York Times to literally deconstruct their fake story uh, about uh, the, the use of mass rape uh, on uh, October 7th, the kind of journalistic ability, uh, I can only marvel at it. I said today, uh, talking of Marvel, uh, they were like uh, Superman and Batman teaming up to fight for truth, justice, and the humanitarian way. And I meant every word of it. I have never been in such awe in front of journalists as I am in front of those two. Aaron, I don't know. 
Max I know well and love him and his wife uh, very much indeed. I, I, I'm becoming emotional talking about them. You have to know the kind of venom which they, as Jewish heroes, are having to stand and face. You think the venom that comes at me is fierce and vile and poisonous and toxic? It is. Can you imagine what it is to be a Jew standing up against these people, standing up against Zionism, standing up against genocide? And not just standing up, not just talking, but undermining fatally the big lies that you have alluded uh, to. I only have time to say this. I can't deal uh, in detail uh, with the questions that you asked. Maybe call back another time and we can discuss it further. When I first became involved in this issue, uh, which would be... Uh, in the middle of the 1970s, so long ago in anybody's currency, the quality of Zionist propaganda was so much higher and so different in quality to what we have now. Zionists in those days claimed that they were the left, they were the socialists, that they had a powerful trade union which owned a bank, that they had kibbutz, that they invited young people to come and experience free love, communal living, share your women, share your uh, cooking, share your eating, everyone looking after everyone's children. They painted a picture, a utopian picture, of a kind of almost primitive communist uh, idea. That's the level that they were at. The Israeli Labour Party, which governed then, was a member of the misnamed, but still named, Socialist International. In truth, they were in bed with apartheid South Africa. In truth, they were in bed with every gold-toothed generalissimo tyrant in Latin America. In truth, uh, they were stealing people's lands on which to build their uh, kibbutz. Uh, in truth, they were on an entirely racist basis, reducing not just the Arab population of Palestine, Israel, to second-class status, but even the black Jews that had come from Ethiopia were illegally sterilized, as has now been found by the Israeli courts, illegally sterilized so that they would not reproduce and Israel wouldn't have to look at the faces of black Jews. The racism which suppurates, festers at the very core of the Zionist idea and the Zionist project was carefully hidden in the past. And one would be invited to tea, as I often was, in a cafe, at Leicester Square Station by admittedly elderly men that were uh, th whose politics on every other issue was just like mine, had the same attitude to the international position that existed in the 1970s, the 1980s. These were people with linen badges and red stars on their lapel who were members of uh, parties that no longer even exist in Israel, but then were in the government, albeit as junior uh, partners. But now, when you look at the Zionist narrative now, when you look at the Zionist discourse now, it is straight out of Der Stormer, the hysterical, venomous, fascist rag, the editor of which was hanged at Nuremberg, Julius Streicher. It is straight out of Goebbels. It is straight out of Streicher. It is unadulterated, racist, 
filth. That's how far down Zionism and its state of Israel has fallen. I don't know if I'll ever see a free Palestine. I'm getting on, but I'm absolutely sure that my children and your children will one day walk in a free Palestine from the river to the sea in which all Jews Christians and Muslims live as equal citizens under the law, just like we fought for in the Republic of South Africa. Hamandla! Long live South Africa! Viva ANC! Viva Nelson Mandela, whose spirit will be in the court in The Hague tomorrow. Thanks for watching. I'm back on Sunday with episode 308. Can you believe it? And millions are watching and calling from Denmark, from Sweden, from Uruguay, from the US, from Canada, from England, Scotland, Wales, Ireland. It's a global university. All right. See you Sunday. <laughs>